Mr. Porritt, thank you so much for joining our second fourth Sustainability Summit. It's a great, a great privilege to speak with you. It's very good to join you today, Agustin. Perfect. Well, to start with the interview, I would like to ask you, how serious is the energy crisis we are going through? It's interesting because we've both got an energy crisis and, of course, we've got a climate emergency. And these two things overlap very painfully at the moment. And the energy crisis is driven by all sorts of factors, not least the upsurge in economic activity since the pandemic, since COVID-19, but also by some of the geopolitical issues regarding Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But we've got to square that with the climate emergency, which of course in the longer term is much, much more serious than the energy crises. Energy crises come and go, we'll sort it out, prices will remain high for quite some time, but we know what to do about that. The climate crisis is a different story altogether for decision makers. Perfect. Well, you mentioned the Russia-Ukraine war. Do you think it's uh, making things worse? In a way, what the war in Ukraine has done is to remind people of the dangers of being dependent on fossil fuels. If you think back over the last, um, well, at least the last 70 years and probably before that, our dependence on fossil fuels has caused an awful lot of bloodshed all around the world. Access to and protection of deposits of oil and gas have caused multiple wars. They've been enormously damaging to the lives of millions of people, even as it's provided us, of course, with this incredible source of energy, namely oil and then gas. But right now, we can and must reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, oil, gas, and of course, coal as well, first and foremost. And we can do that without damaging our economies. So I think the war in Ukraine has just sharpened this sense that we have an opportunity now to reduce the dependence on these fossil fuels, which we need to do anyway, whether or not there was a horror story unfolding in Ukraine. Perfect. And can we live on a 100% renewable energy? We don't need to press for 100% renewable energy. And I'm differentiating here between electricity and energy. We can go very quickly to 100% renewable electricity. We can, some countries are nearly there already and other countries will be able to get there by 2030, 2035, 2040. The technologies work, they're cheap, they're affordable, they deliver the goods. Energy, which of course is more than electricity because it's also transport and heating and industrial uses, manufacturing and so on, it will take us until 2050 to get to a world where we are not using any hydrocarbons at all, or at least a much, much reduced volume of hydrocarbons than we are now. But the reality is we have to get rid of coal as fast as we possibly can, and then progressively reduce our dependence on oil and gas. Great. And what, uh, what can we do to convince governments, politicians, and um, business people that the change can no longer be postponed? You know what it's like, Agustin. If we're going to be effective with politicians, you've got to persuade them that the upside of decarbonizing the economy is bigger than the downside. That's how politics works. That's, in a way, how they got themselves elected and how they probably seek to get themselves re-elected. So we have to work hard to demonstrate to politicians, particularly the younger generation of politicians, that a combination of renewables, efficiency, storage, storing the electricity from renewables, and reconfiguring our grids to make our grid systems much smarter, that that is a much better alternative for their voters than continuing dangerous dependence on fossil fuels. We've got to make continue to make that case. And it's the same in a way in the business community. We've got to be able to persuade investors that this alternative now, this completely different way of looking at energy in our society, in our economies, is going to generate much better and much more secure returns for investors in the future 
than continuing dependence on fossil fuels. So it's all a question of not just balancing the downside, reminding people how chronic the climate emergency is, but balancing that with the upside, which is what are the economic benefits as we move towards these very different economic and energy-based systems that we need. Perfect. And what will be the consequences of moving to clean energy? And in the case of adopting clean energy, how long would it take to see the results considering the damage already done? Yes. <laughs> the, um, the benefits of moving to clean energy are threefold. Firstly, it will create more jobs than the jobs still employed in the fossil fuel industries. And that's if you look at the combination, not just the renewables, but the storage, the efficiency arguments, so retrofitting buildings and so on. In, in the round, net net, there will be more people employed in the clean green energy economy of the future than in the dirty fossil fuel energy of today. Secondly, there'll be far fewer people dying of air pollution. It is an astonishing thing, Augustine, but people forget that somewhere between six and seven million people every year die as a consequence of air pollution from the burning of fossil fuels, either in cars or power stations or factories, whatever it might be. And as soon as we get out of those fossil fuels, that burden, that health burden will disappear. And thirdly, of course, as soon as we move to this different system, we will have stopped putting all of these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. It's the gases from the burning, from the combustion of those fossil fuels that is causing the climate crisis. It's continuing to warm up the atmosphere with all the very damaging consequences that we can already see down here on planet Earth. And we don't need any reminders about this. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us that this is our now or never moment. We have to do what we need to do to decarbonize, get rid of all the carbon-based energy sources in our economy. We have to do that just as fast as we possibly can to avoid a calamitous disruption in human systems in the future. Perfect. And uh, my other question was, how long would it take to see the results considering the damage already done? Yes, well, the results would feed through very quickly in terms of jobs and reduced air pollution. That would be literally a matter of years. As soon as you see improvements in air quality in our cities, for instance, the health burden would be dramatically reduced, dramatically reduced. In terms of the climate benefits, I'm sorry to have to tell people that that will take a lot longer. We have put so much warming into the system that the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere have created so much warming, both in the atmosphere and in the oceans, that it will take decades before we begin to see the benefits flow. We, will, we can't avoid really dramatic disruption in our economies from what we've already done. What we're talking about now is seeking to avoid even more traumatic disruption in the future. So we won't get to the point where we could claim to be enjoying a stable climate again, Augustine, until, until the end of the century. It's, it's, it's a really long haul ahead of us now because we've wasted these 30, 40 years, basically. Perfect, and this is if we start now, we, yes. we need to do it now. This is the point. You have to keep on reminding people about the urgency. You can't go on pushing this off until things look a little bit better in the future. It was very interesting in this intergovernmental report, intergovernmental panels report, where it said politicians cannot go on any longer saying one thing and doing another because they've all got very good at saying they're going to do something about reducing dependence on fossil fuels, about decarbonizing, about investing in the alternatives. We heard them, all of them, in Glasgow at the end of the year at this big conference of the parties in Glasgow and Scotland. They were all promising everything. And then, of course, they get back to their countries and they basically continue with business as usual. And the report spelled it out, and Antonio Guterres made this very clear. He basically said, our politicians today are lying. They're saying one thing and they're doing another. 
and that is imperiling the future of humankind. So that's the first thing we have to stop. Great. And will we see new world players in the production of renewable energy in the future? This is one of the most interesting things because energy and politics have always gone hand in hand. You know, which countries were lucky enough to have access to hydrocarbons, to the coal, the oil and the gas? And how did they use that resource, if you like? With renewables, it's a little bit different. Solar power, for instance, is going to be massively important to some of the poorest nations in the world, let alone to some of the richest. Wind is a slightly different story because the wind doesn't blow uniformly around the world. And some countries have better access to wind, wind power, than others. And of course, if you're a landlocked country, you depend on onshore wind. If you've got coastlines, you can generate a lot of electricity from offshore wind. So I think the one thing that we can absolutely guarantee is that the power politics associated with renewables will be much more evenly distributed. There is no reason to spell it out why Saudi Arabia shouldn't be as big a beneficiary of solar power as India, the United States, and Indonesia. Every country in the world can benefit from this technology in the next decade, not at some crazy distant point in the future, but in the next decade. And I, I put Saudi Arabia in there deliberately, not provocatively. Saudi Arabia could enjoy the fruits of solar power just as much as any other country as it ratchets down its production in oil. Great. Well, once again, thank you very much for your time. The last question would be, Will we have a new economic model based on renewable energy in the future? We don't necessarily need a new economic model because we're shifting from hydrocarbons to renewables. Okay. But in reality, we need an economy that is much less dependent on the very damaging kind of economic growth that we have today. Economic growth has brought financial and material benefits to billions of people, of course, in the last 50, 60 years. We know that. But it's also caused massive damage to the environment, not just climate change, but damage to the natural environment, biodiversity, ecosystems, and so on. So the key thing is, even as we shift from one energy system to the next, the key thing is we have to shift from one kind of growth to the next. And the next paradigm of economic development will be much less damaging to people and places and the planet than our current model of economic growth. And that's a huge shift, Agustin. Politicians have hardly begun to work out what that means. The politics of less growth or degrowth, whatever you like to call it, is a really big challenge that lies ahead of all of us. Great. Well, Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to do this interview. Uh, I was a little bit nervous, so thank you so much for, for your cool. time. For, for, uh, it, it was very interesting talking to you. And um, well, hope in the future the countries and the politicians um, make this change because we need it now. We certainly do. Very good to share this time with you, Agustin. Thank you very much.